So the Hogyoku is truly one of the most abstract concepts to emerge from the realm of Bleach, and it should be no surprise that the series' two greatest minds, the chess masters Kisuke Urahara and Sosuke Aizen, are the two who attempt to meddle with this seemingly godlike power, the power to transgress boundaries that perhaps otherwise shouldn't be broken. But what actually is the Hogyoku? Now, we don't have a lot of answers. The series is purposefully vague about this strange and potentially eldritch creation. And the Hogyoku overall plays a pretty nebulous role in the story of Bleach. But one of my absolute favourite things to do here on the channel is to take a look at some of the slightly weirder concepts in the series and really try and dig deep and see if we can't come up with some answers of our own using what we have here in the manga and beyond. And so in this video, I'm going to try and go deeper into what the Hogyoku actually is, its role in the story, its creation, the main people who play a part in it and what it does, and see if we can't break down the breakdown sphere. That was terrible. <laughs> Before we begin this video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now as you're in the perfect place for Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to show it some love and support me by giving the video a thumbs up as well. It really does help get the video more traction on the whole YouTube algorithm. It means more Bleach fans like yourselves get a chance to see it. And if you want to support me another step further, we have a Patreon on the channel as well now where you can get videos like this one early and you can support me there for as little as a dollar a month. All the names showing up on screen right now are people I want to give a huge shout out to as they are supporting me over there on Patreon, helping me do what I love, which is bring you content like this. So a massive thank you to each and every one of you. So the truth then about the Hogyoku is that we really know very little. Um, there are an awful lot of unanswered questions surrounding this strange little ball. How easy is it to actually create one of these? How many people know how to create them? How universal is the knowledge about creating a Hogyoku? And what does its existence actually mean? for the world of Bleach. It seems as well to be a sentient being. Aizen mentions that the Hogyoku has a will of its own, but what is that will? Is it to simply find a master and then help it reach their true potential? Or is it something maybe even more malevolent than that? The Hogyoku is a genuinely fascinating, if slightly underexplored part of Bleach, but that's really what the crux of this video is going to be all about, looking at the evidence we have within the manga itself to try and determine at least a little bit more about this strange, strange little creation of both Aizen and Urahara's. And speaking of Aizen and Urahara, part of what makes the Hogyoku so fascinating, I think, is that it does involve those two characters so heavily, and they really are the greatest warring minds of the series. Almost the entire series has been commented on before as basically being a chess game between the two of them, and the Hogyoku plays an enormous role in that, in the conflict of the Iran Karak. Now, when I was doing some research for this video prior to filming, I was trying to collate virtually everything we know about the Hogyoku in the story so far, and so much of it is so vague. And also, where the Hogyoku is concerned, things can get a little messy. There is a lot of seemingly misinformation or retcons or characters straight up lying about what the Hogyoku can do. So that makes this even harder than it already was. So I think probably the best way to do this is to start with what I think is a complete and hopefully um, as concrete as we can possibly get timeline of the Hogyoku within the story of Bleach. And so our timeline begins not with Kisuke, but with Aizen, as does so much within the story of Bleach. Seeking greater heights, Sosuke Aizen, before he became a captain, maybe even before he became a vice-captain, was trying to essentially figure out holofication. Now, Aizen wasn't the only person pursuing this research, um, but he was the first one, at least the first one we know, to come to the conclusion of a Hogyoku as being the answer to breaking down those barriers between Shinigami and Hollow. And so, at some point before the main storyline, Aizen creates a Hogyoku of his own, the first one we know of in Bleach's storyline. 
But then how does Aizen know about the Hogyoku in the first place? And this leads me on to my first set of questions regarding this thing. Since the, ho since the idea of a Hogyoku is so strange and Hogyokus themselves are so powerful, is this just common knowledge or did Aizen just sort of have a happy little accident and stumble upon this thing um, almost randomly during his research? That's a little bit strange to me, but regardless, he's the first one to do it in his quest to create a hybrid being. But I'll be honest, the fact that both he and Kisuke came to the same conclusion makes me wonder if the Hogyoku was already a known quantity within the universe. Now, we actually get to see this next bit in the manga itself. Aizen, again, clearly not a captain yet at this point, enlists the help of some Shinigami to basically go out into the Rukongai and carve away souls of hundreds and hundreds of people, both Rukongai citizens with Shinigami potential and the souls of Shinigami themselves. And we actually see these people, these lackeys of Aizen come back, present him the souls they have carved away, and he takes the souls and adds them to his Hogyoku, which at this point seems to be little more than almost a glowing violet light, which he is keeping encased in a tube of sorts. Um, very kind of almost homunculus-esque. Um, there's definitely something quite sinister about this whole thing, not least of the fact that they have had to actually go and potentially kill people to achieve this. Um, in the supplementary novels, we actually learn that Rangiku Matsumoto had within her a nail of the Soul King, and that is what was taken from her when Gein discovers her lying injured in the forest later on, and we find out that the Shinigami then presented that to Aizen, and he added it to his own Hogyoku. So it could be that the Hogyoku itself is fueled by and stems from a piece of the Soul King, but that's something we will discuss later on. So Aizen mentions that the reason he was doing this, the reason he was taking all of these souls and feeding them to his Hogyoku was in an effort to satisfy it and to complete it. But despite doing so, the Hogyoku was never satisfied. And what does a completed and satisfied Hogyoku even mean in the first place? Is a completed Hogyoku perhaps one that allows for fusion? Because Aizen, of course, eventually subjugates it and fuses with it, which seems to be his endgame with this thing. And we know, of course, that even before a Hogyoku is apparently complete, it's already materialising desires around people because it affected Orohime and Chad and Rukia, etc. So that doesn't seem to be a completed Hogyoku. It seems to already be doing that regardless. So the whole thing is a little, as I mentioned before, nebulous. What does a completed Hogyoku even mean? And then, of course, as Aizen is, you know, creating his first Hogyoku, we have to come back round to our biggest question of all. What is a Hogyoku at the end of the day? How does it do things like bestow upon its master something very similar to high-speed regeneration. Although Aizen comments that he would never holofy, it definitely seems as though a Hogyoku is at least in part hollow in nature, as the final transformation it bestows upon Aizen is obviously very hollow-esque. He now has three hollow holes, and the Hogyoku itself seems to float rather ominously in the center of one of them, almost even like it's replacing his heart, much in the same way as how a hollow hole and hollow mask actually works. But then how does, how does that work? Because presumably it's only Shinigami souls that have been fed to this thing. Anyway, if we continue on down our timeline, a short while later, Kisuke Urahara is researching ways to strengthen the Konpaku of Shinigami, presumably just as part of routine research for the Gote 13 military. They're thinking, you know, we're fighting hollows, we need our soldiers to be stronger, and holofication is a way of doing that. Kisuke says that as part of his research into this, he actually discovered holofication and created a substance to break down that barrier, and that substance was the Hogyoku, and this we find out from him in Turn Back the Pendulum. Essentially, this all boils down to both Aizen and Kisuke were looking into holofication for their own agendas, and both of them came to the conclusion that Hogyoku was the best way to do it. In Turn Back the Pendulum, we know that Kisuke uses the Hogyoku. I'm not entirely sure how or what that even means, but he uses it to stabilize the visors who have been you know, infected by Hollow Reatsu, and in doing so, he saves their lives, and then all of them flee to the human world. 
at some point after this, during his time in exile in the human world, Kisuke decides that the Hogyoku he has created is just too dangerous. It's far too dangerous a substance to be allowed to exist in the world, um, and he tries to destroy it. And he spends years trying to destroy it, and he is unsuccessful every time. He has no idea how to actually destroy this thing that he has created. And again, that really comes back to the idea of this being a real kind of eldritch creation, something that Kisuke himself doesn't even truly understand. Um, and he, does, he doesn't know how to, how to be rid of it. Um, and this, of course, will be important later on. And so, with no way to destroy his Hogyoku, Kisuke decides instead to try and deactivate and hide it. So he places it within a protective shell, and then at some point at the very start of the Bleach story, he approaches Rukia and offers her a Gigai, secretly implanting the Hogyoku within it. This Gigai, of course, as we know, is designed to sap her powers, eventually turning her into a normal human and successfully hiding the Hogyoku forever. Unfortunately for Kisuke, however, Aizen has been delving into Urahara's own research and has been continuing his holofication experiments ever since Kisuke was banished from the Soul Society. And of course, we see this in Everything But The Rain. Even as Aizen has become a captain, he is still progressing on with his twisted work. And by looking into Kisuke's own research, Aizen learns that Rukia is the hiding place of the Hogyoku at some point between Turn Back the Pendulum and the start of Bleach. Discovering this secret, Aizen sends Rukia to Karakura Town, both to lure Kisuke Urahara out and also to help start and test Ichigo's growth and development as someone who could be a perfect hybrid. Obviously, Aizen is intrigued by him since he understands the the very unique heritage that Ichigo has. And of course, the rest is history. The rest is the Soul Society arc. Aizen, posing as the Central 46, tries to get Rukia executed so her body is destroyed, revealing the Hogyoku, which he can then take for himself. Of course, Ichigo and his friends foil this plan, so Aizen has to resort to Plan B. And once again, this is using Urahara's research that he has been meticulously poring over since Urahara was forced to leave Soul Society. He discovers a new technology that Kisuke created to remove a foreign object from a Konpaku, and he does just this to steal Urahara's own Hogyoku. Aizen then flees Soul Society for Waco Mundo, and it's important to know at this point that Aizen has now two Hogyoku in his possession, the original one he created right at the start of this timeline, using a piece of even Matsumoto's soul to get there, and the new one he has just stolen from Rukia's body. It's difficult to know exactly what comes next in the timeline. At some point during this period of peace before the fake Karakura Town battle, Aizen offers Kisuke's Hogyoku to his own one in an effort to complete and satisfy it, which seemingly works. It's just difficult to know exactly when that happens. In chapter 229, we get to see Aizen actually use the Hogyoku. We've known for a little while that he has been using it to essentially... Uh, create Iran cars at a rapid pace and make them more complete and more powerful than ever before. And we see him actually doing this when he creates Wonderweiss. It's interesting as well because the Hogyoku actively fuses with Aizen's finger for a brief moment, allowing him to complete the Hogyoku momentarily and create Wonderweiss. And this is some nice foreshadowing to the fact that Aizen would eventually subjugate and fuse with it entirely later on down the line. It's possible that by chapter 249, when Aizen reveals that he has shown Orohime the Hogyoku supposedly as a measure of trust, um, it's possible that he's already fused the two together by this point, as the Hogyoku we see here has a different protective casing to the one he took out of Rukia. Um, but again, it's effectively impossible to know at this point. But I would assume that he probably has done, as he probably would have done it fairly quickly after escaping Soul Society. And then flash very far forward to chapter 396. The final battle is well underway, and Aizen reveals to Ichigo that he has in fact fused himself with the Hogyoku Yoku, which of course is his original Hogyoku, which is now complete, having been fed Kisuke's one. And this Hogyoku is going so far as to even protect Aizen, who claims that it now sees him as his master, employing techniques that are very similar to things like high-speed regeneration. 
But it's not until chapter 400 that things start to get really crazy. Aizen is duking it out with Ishin, and having already fought, you know, Yamamoto, the entire Gote 13, Aizen's getting tired, you know, he's reaching his limit as a Shinigami. Even Aizen has that limit, of course, this is the limit he wishes to break. And so it's during this fight with Ishin, you know, Ishin's like, what, well, you seem to be slowing down, are you, are you tiring out already? And Aizen says, yes, you know, it appears I have reached my limit. And because of that, the Hogyoku is awakening and responding to the desires within his heart. The Hogyoku is beginning to understand who I truly am. In the next chapter 401, Aizen delves even further into this, basically saying that the Hogyoku, he has now become its master. And because of that, it is starting to respond to the desires within his heart, replacing his soul and transforming him into a being that will break those boundaries he mentioned before. It's also in this chapter that we learn the truth about the Hogyoku, that what we've been told to believe all along, which is this orb was created for the sole purpose of destroying the boundary between Shinigami and Hollow, is actually not what it can do. Although it seems like that on the surface, the Hogyoku's true ability is to essentially look into the hearts of those around it and realise their deepest desires. Now, these are some acts and desires that the Hogyoku has supposedly materialised throughout the series. When Kisuke Urahara created it, he didn't realise its true ability because when he created it, he did so wanting to break the boundary between Shinigami and Hollow, so that's what it did. It was simply materialising his desire, and he took that to mean that was what it actually did. When Rukia transferred her powers to Ichigo, she lost all of them instead of only some of them, and that was the Hogyoku materialising her desire to lose everything, due to the guilt she felt about killing Kaien. And then also, when Orohime and Chad got their powers, that was actually the doing of the Hogyoku, because they themselves apparently cursed their own powerlessness. I want to just take a, a brief detour for a second to say that when this chapter came out way back in the day, um, sort of, you know, 2009 or 2010, whenever it was, this was very unpopular. <laughs> this was this was not popular because the Hogyoku, we had been firmly told exactly what it can do and exactly its place and role in the story to the point where it was involved in Turn Back the Pendulum. And now arbitrarily, it's just this wish ball, as I think people used to call it, that can just do what, whatever Kubo needs it to do, essentially. It can now be used to retroactively explain literally everything that has happened in Bleach up until now. Things like Orohime and Chad getting their powers despite not being around Ichigo at the time they, they received them. You know, Orohime gets her powers when Tatsuki is in trouble, but now apparently that's the will of the Hogyoku. And that brings us back to that ever nebulous question, what is the will of the Hogyoku? But for now... Aizen is revealing all. This is also when Aizen's supposedly I have foreseen everything and planned everything out meticulously was beginning to stretch some people's suspension of disbelief a little bit, as Aizen reveals that he always knew that the Hogyoku wasn't about breaking down the barrier between Shinigami and Hollow, he just didn't know exactly what its power actually was. Um, and so the experiments he did on Shinji and the others to turn them into Visards wasn't only an experiment on holofication, it was also to test the limits of the Hogyoku's powers. He theorised that the Hogyoku should never have been able to turn Shinji, etc. into proper Visards. But when it did, that confirmed that its true power was actually realising Urahara's desires. Um, and so he sent Rukia to Karakura Town at this point to test it even further. However, Aizen does reveal that the Hogyoku is only capable of materialising what someone can actually realistically achieve. So at least there, there is a slight weakness in this thing. I do kind of wonder, though, you know, why the Hogyoku only seemed to affect certain people. You know, why didn't the Hogyoku have any effect on characters like Uryu, for instance, who, you know, also spent time around Rukia as well. But much later on, as Aizen has begun to undergo this transformation, he claims that now the Hogyoku is understanding his heart. It's transforming him into a being that crosses the boundaries between the divine and the earthly, as he puts it at some point. Kisuke finally arrives on the battlefield and we get a wonderful interaction between the two of them, the two of them who have actually had some kind of involvement in the Hogyoku. 
This also shows a great dichotomy between their two characters, in my opinion. Basically, I, Kisuke shows up and says to Aizen that, you know, it's a very strange look you're sporting all of a sudden. Um, and Aizen says, well, you know, midway through evolution is always ugly. At which point, Kisuke kind of has this strange, sad look on his face. And he's like, I never said it was ugly. And, and that's really interesting to me because obviously, you know, Kisuke is a true scientist at the end of the day. And this kind of, this kind of, um, divolves into an entirely separate video, but we'll go over it slightly here, which is the rivalry between Aizen and Kisuke and how Aizen, despite his, you know, enormous god complex, has this real sense of inferiority around Kisuke, much like Mayuri does, but on a slightly different level. And you get, you get a lot of that here in this conversation, which I think is, is really effective. But, you know, Kisuke says, well, I never said it was ugly. So, you know, Kisuke finds it fascinating more than ugly. He's less concerned about the physical appearance than he is about what's actually going on here. Um, but then Aizen moves to kind of gloat to Kisuke that, you know, you, I've I've actually subjugated the Hogyoku, the Hogyoku that you fail to truly understand, fail to truly control. Um, again, kind of gloating, being like, I'm better than you. You know, as a scientist, I'm I'm better than you. Despite the fact that Aizen was forced to steal Kisuke's Hogyoku and his research into the technology to remove it from a Konpaku in the first place. And at this point, Kisuke hints that he knows more than he's letting on by saying, oh yeah, the Hogyoku that I couldn't control back in the day at least anyway, implying that he maybe knows secrets about the Hogyoku now that Aizen does not. And this of course annoys Aizen. Aizen says, well, that just seems like a demonstration of sour grapes on your part that you uh, that you, you know, you you failed to do this before I did. I did it first, so I'm better than you. And Aizen very uncharacteristically just leaps at Kisuke and stabs him in the chest, being like, you know, you'll never have this chance again. You've totally lost your chance to control the Hogyoku. And of course, Aizen lunging at Kisuke like that is very, very unusual for him. But it's because of this animosity that he feels on a personal level to someone he thinks is looking down their nose at him. He thinks that Kisuke is saying these kind of spiteful things. He, well, he thinks they're spiteful because he thinks that Kisuke is annoyed that Aizen has bested him about his own creation. But really, you know, Kisuke does actually know more than he is letting on. Then, of course, Kisuke, in their ensuing battle, does try and kill Aizen, but Aizen survives it, and the Hogyoku continues to transform him even further. And you get another lovely moment where Aizen basically turns around and says, you know, had it not been I, and then he, he kind of recants, and he says, actually, had it not been I who had subjugated the completed Hogyoku, you would have just killed me. And that's a really nice moment, again, kind of showing almost a begrudging respect to Kisuke, actually, for once saying, yeah, you probably would have won that. And then again, much later in the timeline, once Aizen has defeated Kisuke, Yoroichi and Ishin and moved into the real Karakura town, Gin betrays him, obviously in revenge for what he witnesses right at the start of our timeline when Matsumoto has some of her soul shaved away by Aizen to create his original Hogyoku. This is Gin's revenge coming into fruition. And Gin destroys Aizen's body and is able to actually pluck the Hogyoku from him. And now I have to wonder personally why the Hogyoku doesn't just up and abandon Aizen right now, because Aizen is as good as dead at this point. You know, he basically, he, he would be dead. And Gangin has actually managed to take the Hogyoku, so I'm surprised it doesn't abandon him yet. Clearly it thinks that he can go further, which is why I assume it returns to him now. Despite not being actually in Aizen's body at this point, it still recognises him as its master and it literally warps from Gein's hand in back into Aizen's chest again after it has reformed and transformed him into butterflies at this point. But he has now become a being that transcends both Shinigami and Hollow, which is what he originally set out to achieve, which is what the Hogyoku was originally kind of forcing upon him as it read his heart. And then as we enter the final battle between Ichigo and Aizen, and things do get interesting here, when the Hogyoku kind of senses that Aizen might be struggling against Ichigo, it forces, Aizen's not even dead, dead at this point, but it forces a new and gruesome transformation upon him. Um, and obviously we see him look now like a complete monster, more hollow-like than ever. But interestingly here, for the first time, Aizen verbalizes Hogyoku's own thoughts. We've been told already that it is a sentient being um, uh, in its own way, and it has its own mind and its own will. And Aizen says, oh, you know, I, I understand, Hogyoku, you don't want me to, you can't tolerate and you can't forgive me being bested by a human. 
which is really interesting. For the first time, to me at least, it feels like the Hogyoku is calling the shots here. This is where it feels like the Hogyoku is perhaps more in charge than Aizen is. Even though Aizen is the so-called master of the two of them at the moment, the Hogyoku is the one that won't tolerate him being so injured by Ichigo. And this is really reinforced, I think, by the fact that the Hogyoku now sits very smugly in the absolute centre of Aizen's being, perhaps even replacing his heart at this point. Now, after being hit by Mugetsu, Ichigo's ultimate attack, Aizen loses most of his powers. They are stripped from him in one massive strike. And at this point, he seems to think that the Hogyoku is still working with him. As his Zanpak toe crumbles to dust, Aizen comments that the Hogyoku has declared, I no longer even need a Zanpak toe. I'm beginning to transform even more than I already am. However, this is absolutely not what I think is going on here. Um, and I know there is some debate about what's actually happening here. Um, but for me, Deicide has been entirely about Aizen's delusions and them collapsing around him, him being wrong about literally everything. Um, it's about the death of a god in more ways than one, not just his physical defeat, but also the fact that someone who has been in control for over 100 years is now losing his mind and everything is going wrong for him. You know, we've seen it when he incorrectly assumes that Ichigo has thrown away his Reiatsu, and we see it again here where he incorrectly assumes the Hogyoku has decided he doesn't need a Zanpak Toe anymore. The Hogyoku has already abandoned him at this point. We see that in literally a couple of pages. What I actually think is happening here is Aizen is paying the price for having abandoned his Zanpak Toe. He's turned his back on it, and as a response, his Zanpak Toe is fading away. Now, obviously, the two of them would have a chance to rekindle in Muken for the next three years or whatever it is before he returns in the Thousand Year Blood War, which is why he gets his Zanpak Toe back. Um, but that's my thinking anyway. Um, but it's very symbolic, I think, here that Aizen thinks he's on the edge of receiving another power-up, but in reality, everything is disappearing for him. So the crumbling Zanpak Toe, to me at least, feels like a literal representation of him turning away from it. And we know the Hogyoku can't be forcing another transformation on him because we know it's already decided to abandon him after being hit by Mugetsu. When Kisuke shows up on the scene, he mentions that he knew it would be nearly impossible to kill Aizen after he fused with the Hogyoku, which of course we know to be accurate, as Kisuke has spent years trying to destroy this thing only to find it completely impossible. And the Hogyoku then strips Aizen of all his newly acquired power as it seemingly leaves his side. However, Ichigo actually counters this idea after the fight has concluded when he has a nice little chat with Kisuke after the battle is over. Ichigo challenges the idea, saying that he wonders if perhaps the Hogyoku never actually abandoned Aizen and instead gave him what he wanted deepest in his heart, perhaps even subconsciously, which was to lose his powers and become a regular Shinigami on the same level as everybody else, because he's been alone at the top for so long. I think there is probably some truth to this on some level, but as I've mentioned before on this channel, I do take umbrage with this idea, and I do wonder if maybe Ichigo is not quite on the mark here, or if there's at least um, an element of both sides at play. And the reason I think that is because Aizen explicitly says, back during the big fight, that the Hogyoku is finally starting to understand who he truly is as it is reading his heart. And as it does that, it's replacing his soul with one that can actually transcend Hollows and Shinigami. So he clearly does want to achieve that form at some point. Then there's the fact that Ichigo argues that because Aizen was born exceptional, maybe, maybe he was seeking someone who could see his own viewpoint, which is perhaps why Aizen was coaxing Ichigo along, helping in his development. But then Ichigo mentions that when Aizen couldn't find anyone like that, he gave up trying and instead wished to be brought down to the same level as everybody else. However, if that's the case, I'd argue the Hogyoku hasn't really given him what he wants at all. Because despite having his hybrid powers seemingly stripped away from him, he is still absurdly more powerful than virtually everyone else in the series, to the point where in the Thousand Year Blood War, his Reiatsu is still enough to decimate a nearby soul, making him as lonely, if not more lonely, than ever before. But maybe that's his curse. And that's basically it then for our comprehensive timeline for the Hogyoku as it appears in Bleach. Now, as I mentioned during my research, I came across a bunch of oddities and what I feel like are some inconsistencies surrounding this thing. Definitely, I think Kubo struggled a little bit 
with the serialized format to really include the Hogyoku both early on and then bring it back into relevance later on. Clearly he wanted it to have a massive role in Aizen's development as a villain in the final battle, but some things had to be changed along the way. So I've got a couple of, shall we say, oddities I just want to discuss very briefly. In chapter 175, when Aizen is kind of explaining his grand master plan, he mentions that many people looked into the field of holofication first, but many of them stopped pushing their research due to laws and ethics. Eisen says that his own research into holification was basically exclusively focused on giving hollows Shinigami-like abilities, the ability to cancel Reiatsu or to destroy Zanpak Toe. He then says it was Kisuke Urahara who, working outside of the Soul Society's kind of scientific community, developed the Hogyoku. Except in chapter 416, Aizen mentions that he was the one to come up with the idea of Hogyoku first. It is highly possible that he was lying about literally everything during this speech in End of Hypnosis, as he does mention later on, which we'll get to. But that does seem a bit weird to me. Like, why would you lie about De it details that just aren't, don't need to be lied about during your kind of big grandiose moment. This idea of him lying about everything back here is reinforced by this next point again, which is actually brought up in the manga itself. But this is when Aizen says that he originally only noticed Rukia had the Hogyoku within her after she went missing in the human world. But in chapter 398, he reveals that he already knew she had the Hogyoku within her, and that's why he sent her to Karakura Town in the first place. Now, this is, as I mentioned, actually addressed in the manga. Aizen says that, you know, if you think I'm telling the truth, or if you think I'm lying now, what makes you think I was telling the truth back then? Which implies that, yeah, he was lying about not knowing that, but again, I question why even bother lying about that in the first place. It does make sense for the character involved, but it's undeniably a little confusing. Also in chapter 175, Aizen mentions that the reason Kisuke was banished from the Soul Society was for creating an untraceable Gigai, one that would strip the user of all of its Ryatsu over time. And it's not just Aizen who says this, this line has been parroted by a number of characters in the earlier stages of Bleach. Um, but of course, once you get to Term at the Pendulum, you realise that's absolutely not the case, and also Aizen would be fully aware of the real reason as to why Kisuke had to leave the Soul Society. Society. Um, this is one that is a retcon, I think, but I'm absolutely fine with it because I think Turn Out the Pendulum provides a much more interesting answer, and it does also include the creation of the Gee Guys anyway. And then in chapter 176, when Aizen retrieves the Hogyoku from Rukia, he notes to himself that this thing, it's so small, this is the Hogyoku. Amazing. But Aizen should already have his own Hogyoku by this point in the story that he has been actually feeding souls to since before he came a captain, so he should already know what it looks like, and we know from looking at the Hogyokus they look exactly the same. Again, this one feels to me, it feels like the main point of contention for Kubo as a writer was that he just hadn't decided that Aizen would have his own Hogyoku yet, that Kisuke's one would be the only one in existence that was created back in turn at the pendulum for the sole purpose of saving the visards. But then eventually he decided that it makes more sense for Aizen to have also come to this conclusion and then fuse the two together. And then finally, in chapter 401, Aizen reveals that he already knew Kisuke Urahara had succeeded in turning Shinji and the others into complete visards. However, looking at turn back the pendulum, we know that those experiments were conducted in the 12th Division's barracks and they were then whisked away by Tessai and Yoroichi before really anyone got a chance to see them. Also, Aizen himself actually mentions in Everything But The Rain, which is about 20 years prior to the main storyline, that he's still trying to track down Shinji and the others. So I don't really know how he would as of yet determined that they were proper visards, especially since when Shinji appears in front of him in the fake Karakura town, he kind of says to Aizen, you know, how do you like our new look? We've gotten pretty good with these masks, implying this is the first time they've had any communication for over 100 years. And so as we kind of come to the close of this video, I've got a couple of more smaller points I would like to mention, but we kind of get back to that major question of what is the Hogyoku, because really we haven't 
as of yet been able to answer it. There are some small little points I do want to bring up that I think are quite interesting. Again, in chapter 175, there's a really intriguing panel that shows Kisuke as a captain working in a lab, and there is a mysterious shadowy silhouette behind him of someone who looks like they're either talking to him or acting a little suspiciously. Now, it could just be somebody working in the lab with Kisuke around the creation of the Hogyoku before Kubo decided that Kisuke made it alone. But I like to think that this is actually kind of foreshadowing the idea that Aizen would eventually steal Kisuke's own Hogyoku. It looks like, you know, somebody is watching his works from afar, which, of course, would be Aizen. In Term at the Pendulum as well, Tessai notes that, and Tessai, of course, being a, you know, majorly powerful Shinigami, the Kido core captain, he would know a lot about the magic of the world, for instance, notes that the Hogyoku, its very existence, its very power, feels like it's trying to stifle his own existence. It feels like it's trying to suffocate him out of existence. And I think that's really interesting because, to me, that tells me that the Hogyoku is inherently malevolent, or at least there is something about it that is really not quite right. And it goes back to this idea of it being this eldritch force that just should not exist. In that sense, it, it really does feel like the one of the strangest things to be in this universe, really something artificial almost that absolutely should not be here because it bends and breaks the laws of Bleach. And it feels like that all those who go after it are cursed. You know, Kisuke had the foresight at least to realise that this thing is wrong and it should not be it should not be allowed to be and he tries to destroy it but fails um, and you know he's kind of haunted by it in a sense and then Aizen actually goes after and pursues and embraces the Hogyoku and we see it twists him into a monster uh, you know both physically and mentally by the end of Deicide and so right at the end here let's finally go back to that question of what is a Hogyoku and I think we just don't have a concrete answer but I've got a couple of small ideas. So a Hogyoku is supposed to be a sentient being with a will of its own. And what is that will? What does it want? Is its will simply to find a suitable master and then push them to greatness before, you know, abandoning them if they can't achieve their own goals? The fact that it abandons Aizen like that feels quite callous, and it does feel like the Hogyoku is egging him on in that final battle. You know, it forces that transformation on him when it thinks that's what he needs to defeat Ichigo, and then it's, you know, Aizen believes that it thinks he is failing it. So I do wonder if the Hogyoku is seeking out a worthy master, perhaps. That's what it actually wants. Um, and, you know, those it doesn't consider to be worthy, as we see with Tessai, it's actively trying to blot out their existence, which, again, is, is a really cool idea. We know when Hollows, how kind of the process that behind the birth of, say, Gillians, you know, Menos, when Hollows all come together, loads of Hollow souls kind of come together and a dominant mind takes hold. Maybe something similar is happening here. We know that the Hogyoku is created by carving away hundreds and hundreds of Shinigami souls, and maybe eventually they coalesce and a dominant mind comes forth. Um, obviously not in the same way as, as, as a hollow, they don't really seem to retain any kind of individuality, um, but it, maybe it creates even like a sort of hive mind of these souls. Um, it's really, it's really hard to say, it does get very conceptual at this point. And then, finally, I do wonder if the Hogyoku is well and truly connected to the Soul King himself. Um, it does seem like this kind of unnatural power is normally attributed to the Soul King, um, and what the Hogyoku can do seems to be very reminiscent of Gerard Valkyrie's The Miracle. You know, he is the heart of the Soul King, and he cannot die. You know, he comes back to life many, many times over, which is exactly the same as what happens when Aizen is put through the ringer by the Hogyoku, essentially coming back with a new form again and again. And that's exactly what happens to Gerard. He gets a new form every time he resurrects. And the idea behind the miracle, even though it's a little bit weird and it feels like Kubo simplifies it as the actual fight takes hold, but the original idea behind it is that it, it materialises the wishes of the masses in Gerard himself so that he can achieve the impossible. And that's, you know, exactly what the Hogyoku is. It materialises the will of those around it. So eff effectively, they can achieve their truest potential. And Aizen himself says that the Hogyoku is mostly just a guiding light, you know, used to help people achieve what they can. 
Now, as I mentioned briefly earlier, I think in Can't Fear Your Own World, it is alluded to that Hogyokus are essentially created with a sort of fragment of the Soul King acting as a linchpin, which are then fed Shinigami souls to kind of feed on almost and then power up. And it, that makes a lot of sense to me in a way because the Soul King is apparently so godlike he has all these weird powers and that would make sense that the heart of a Hogyoku is a piece of him and therefore that's why it can do all these crazy things. Um, you know, it's almost like because because of Gerard is the heart of the Soul King, a small piece of him almost is within the Hogyoku, which is how it can continually revive people and stuff like that. But at this point, we are getting very much into conjecture and speculation because really I have no idea. We know with Mimi Hagi and Pernida that Soul King body parts can gain their own sentience after a while, so maybe that's exactly what's happening here with the Hogyoku as well. But that's pretty much it for this pretty exhaustive and unfortunately um, fairly, I would argue, inconclusive video on the Hogyoku, but it was a lot of fun to delve deep into one of Bleach's greatest mysteries, I think. This thing is so weird, and I do think a big part of it is that it's purposefully vague because we're not supposed to truly understand it, much like the characters in the series itself. It is this eldritch abomination of a creation that Kisuke regrets and should never have come across, and Aizen embraces and, you know, wants more from, and it is very difficult to control. It is, it is very difficult to understand what it actually wants. You know, what does it want? And so to me, the Hogyoku is a fascinating footnote in, in Bleach history. It's one that I think Kubo struggled with a little bit, and you can really see that when you go back and reread big chunks of the Arankar arc, where there are some there are some pretty big loopholes being made for Aizen to get through for things to start making sense. You know, I truly believe that Aizen never had his own Hogyoku up until Kubo decided that was what had to happen. Um, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe it should shed some light. Let me know in the comments below. I would really, really appreciate it. What do you guys think of the Hogyoku? What do you think it actually is? And what do you think of its role in the Bleach universe? I would love to hear down below. All right, guys, but until next time, make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already, and then I'll catch you later. See ya.